the agenda for this video uh, on the paired t-test is we're going to set up the hypothesis we're going to look at the distribution of the test statistic under the null and alternative and we're also going to do a quick investigation of the standard deviation of the differences and that and that's what uh, R requires us to plug in to calculate power and sample size and all this will be illustrated within R here we're going to assume that we have two uh, samples one from a normal distribution mu1 and a, and a common variance sigma squared second one is a normal mu2 common variance uh, not required but in for this purpose it's, uh, it's going to help with the illustration and we're going to take the differences of, of these observations the, the population 1 minus 2 and we're going to come up with the difference the hypothesis we're going to test are the differences 0 or not 0 and we have all our sample statistics and the test statistic uh, is this it's the mean over the standard error of the mean you know which is the difference the standard deviation of the differences divided by sample size now under the null hypothesis it's a central t distribution with n d minus one degrees of freedom and under the alternative it's a non-central t with this uh, non-centrality parameter and this right here is what we're going to further investigate on this next page and um, one thing to note is this the standard deviation of the differences will, depends upon the correlation between X1 and X2. Now this could be pre-treatment, post-treatment where it's the same subject or same patient, you know, pre and post, or we could just match on characteristics of different patients. But regardless, there's some correlation between pre and post uh, treatment. So if this is the setting, it can be shown that the distribution of the differences is normal with the differences of the means with this variance, where rho is the correlation between x1 and x2. So my point in bringing this up is if you know the variance of the pre-population and you use that in the R software, you are going to underestimate the needed sample size. Uh, what's, what's common is you take, you know, if you know the pre or the post variance, and in this case we're assuming the same, you can take twice that variance and plug it into the R software for paired t-test, and it's going to be a conservative estimate. That's assuming that the, the correlation is positive. And in most cases it is. If you have the same patient pre and post, then there's going to be a positive correlation there. But if it's a negative correlation, then two times the uh, common variance is, is going to underestimate the needed sample size. But in this setting, you know, which we're assuming that the null is true, so this is a true distribution, we can show that this is the non-centrality parameter where the non-centrality parameter depends upon the correlation between the pre and the post with the x1 and the x2. Okay, now let's illustrate this in R. I'm in R on a Ubuntu Linux based machine and we're going to investigate the paired sample t-test. Here we're going to look at mu d which stands for the mean of the differences is zero versus the mean of the differences is not zero. And so to illustrate this concept, we have to pick values. So we're going to let alpha be 0.05 and um, the sample size be 30. So here we are. And then let's create some data and look at plot of this distribution. So here's the, the T distribution for the paired sample T test with uh, 30 uh, a sample size of 30 which is uh, 29 degrees of freedom so now we need to pick uh, cutoff values to make these areas both 0 0.05 or uh, alpha over 2 which is 0 0.025 so we conduct our test statistic and if it falls in the rejection region 
then we reject the null hypothesis and that the mean of the differences is not zero. If it falls in, in within the, here in the center, then we do not reject the null hypothesis and there's not enough evidence to say that it is not zero. So let's look at what happens under the alternative hypothesis and when that is true we need to pick values that make the alternative hypothesis true. So if we pick a mu1 of 4 and a mu2 of 2 then and a standard deviation of the differences of 4 Let's look at what happens with the distribution. So this is assuming that the alternative is true and we get a non-central T distribution with 29 degrees of freedom and with a, with a certain non-centrality parameter. So to calculate power, <coughs> we need to find the probability that we're in the rejection region under this distribution, which is the case when the alternative is true. So let's shade in the regions that we want to find power for. So it's this green area and actually there's a very small green line here which you probably will not be able to pick up but those combined are power. And to calculate power in R we use the power.t.test and um, we put in in D which is 30 and our, the mean of the differences which are is 4 and 2, so that's going to be 2, a standard deviation of 4. So 4, 2, 4. So we're back here. So this delta is 2, the standard deviation of the differences is 4, 0 0.05, and we're looking to find power. So we do that, and we have 75% power. Okay. So let's say we wanted 80% power, then we're going to have to increase the sample size. So we will find that in a second. But first let's calculate power from first principles. So we can find the area under this curve in R using the PT function. That's the cumulative distribution function. And we want to find it from a specific point. And we use that from QT. QT is the quantile function of the T distribution where you give it an area and then it finds a specific T value that makes it true and then we have a certain non-centrality parameter. So let's calculate the right area, the left, and then add them together. And the power is exactly the same as the power.t.test. So let's calculate the needed sample size. The, the assuming we wanted 80% power under the same setting. So the true difference here is 2. So it's 4 minus 2. And the common or the uh, standard deviation of the differences is 4 under the same alpha level. And we would need 34 subjects to have 80% power. Now let's investigate the correlation between the pre and the post. <clears throat> so here it's assumed that you know the standard deviation of the differences, the true standard deviation of the differences. And you may or may not know that. If you've done the experiment before and you can look at the standard deviation of the differences that you achieved in a previous experiment, then you can use that as an estimate of the true standard deviation of the differences. But if you don't know that, and this is the first time you're conducting the test, then you have to be a little more careful and you have to know what's going on behind the scenes. So if you assume that our population one or the pre is, so, is a normal distribution with mu one and a common variance of sigma squared. Post is uh, normal mu two common sigma squared. Then the distribution of the differences is actually normal with, with mu one minus mu two. The and the variance is sigma squared times two minus p, where p is the correlation between the pre and the post. And so th that also affects your um, your 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 sample size and your power. So let's assume here that we're remember we're in the four two four setting. So uh, mean four mean mu two is two, and we're going to say the common variance 
between these two populations is 4, but there's a positive correlation between the two populations, which is often the case. You know, if you have the same subject pre and post, then pre and post observations are usually positively correlated. So in this setting, let's calculate the needed sample size. And 49 is needed. So in the previous case we did, we assumed that the standard deviation of the differences was 4. But here we're saying that's just the common variance and we have a correlation. So we actually need more uh, observations. We need 40, 50, 50 subjects in each arm because, there's, because of the positive correlation. Now, if it were negative, so there's a negative correlation between pre and post, which is usually not the case, then we would even need more observation. We need 80. So um, that's how correlation between pre and post affects the sample size. So let's go to the extreme cases. Let's assume that there's a, there's a positive correlation of 1. That means if we know the pre values, we actually know the post because it's a hundred it's a hundred percent correlated, so it's a one to one function between pre and the post. And and let's calculate the sample size. And there that gets us thirty four observations and that's what we put in the first time. And now let's assume that there's a a negative correlation of negative one, which is also the case if you know the pre, you know the post, but if they're negatively correlated, you must calculate sample size. Here there, we need 97 uh, observations. So the, the point of this is you to, to estimate the true sample size needed for a certain power, you either need to know the true standard deviation of the differences, or if you're going to use one of the variances for pre or post, then you need to kind of have an estimate of what the correlation between the two observations are. Or you could do the extreme. You could take three times the, the variance or three times the standard deviation, and then that gives you an upper bound of the sample sizes needed. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the video.